Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today here at the Yale School of Management to learn more about the Silva Scholars Program. My name is Maria Delipanska and I'm a Senior Associate Director of Admissions here at Yale SOM. And I'm joined by five current Silva Scholars. Uh, some are in their first, some are in their final year of the program. And um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to say that we have two um, students that are currently um, on their extended internship. So um, they are joining us just for this webinar um, to tell you a little bit more about their experience. So I'd like to say a quick word about the format of the event before we begin. Um, I will start with a brief overview of the Silver Scholars program. Um, I would really like to make a few points about what makes the program um, unique and um, also address some really common questions and concerns about uh, the program itself and applying to the Super Scouts program. Um, then I will let the students introduce themselves. I have prepared a few questions for them. And for the second portion of the event, we would like to go to you, the virtual audience, and really hear what questions you have on your mind. Um, I have my colleague Kayla working behind the scenes. Uh, she will be fielding your questions, so please make sure to use the um, Q&A feature of the Zoom platform uh, to send her your questions and she will be forwarding them to me, uh, which is why I'll keep a close eye on my computer here in front of me. Um, so about the Silver Scholars program, um, as probably all of you know by now, uh, the reason why the program was created was to really give an opportunity um, for college seniors to enroll in an MBA program immediately after they complete their undergraduate studies. Um, and this is really the first point that I would like to make about the program and what makes it very, very unique. Um, so you graduate from your college or university in the spring, in May or June, and you come join us at the Yale School of Management immediately after that in August to start the first year of the MBA program. Um, secondly, I would really like to stress that the Silva Scholars program is the exact same two-year full-time MBA program that all of our students here at SOM complete. The only difference is in this um, internship requirement. So young professionals entering the program uh, with several years of work experience are required to complete a summer internship between the first and second year of the MBA program. And the Silva Scholars, because they enter the program with no full-time work experience, just with internships on their resume, are required to complete an extended internship, which essentially means working full-time for a year between the first and final year of the MBA program. Uh, many of our students actually choose to extend that internship to uh, two years or more. Um, some of them have chosen to split the internship year between two different internships, um, oftentimes at two different companies on two different continents. We'll speak um, a little bit more about that later in the webinar uh, because we have students on the panel that have chosen to, uh, to do that, to extend their internship. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to really highlight the flexibility of the internship requirement. Um, Silva Scholars comprise about 5% of the total MBA class and they're fully integrated with the MBA experience, which means that um, they are equally distributed among the five cohorts um, at the Yale School of Management, and they uh, fully participate in all the student clubs, uh, organizations, affinity groups, um, and student government. So um, who is a good candidate for the program uh, is a common question that, uh, that we get. Um, I would really like to stress that uh, we're really looking for students of all academic majors, professional experiences, and career aspirations. Um, in fact, I always say that there's no such thing as a typical Silva Scholar, and every year, almost every si uh, single Silva Scholar that we admit into the program uh, comes from a different academic background. Um, some students come from very uh, quantitative disciplines, such as um, economics, accounting, uh, business, um, finance, and so on. Um, others come from non-quant disciplines, such as uh, English language and literature, um, art history, sociology, psychology, political science, and so on. 
Um, and of course, we have students in the class that have majored in engineering, law, computer science, uh, physical and biological sciences, and so on. Um, similarly, in regards to their professional experiences, uh, we welcome students from all different backgrounds. Uh, most students have done uh, the sort of uh, traditional corporate structured internships in finance, technology, um, consulting, marketing, and so on. Um, but many are entrepreneurs. They have started their own ventures. Um, some have joined the family business. Um, others have extensive lab or research experience, so they're young scientists. Um, in regards to the application process, um, it's the exact same process for everyone that applies to our full-time MBA program, um, with two small ex exceptions for the Silva Scholars, um, the letters of recommendation and the interview. Um, Silva Scholars are required to submit one academic and one professional letter of recommendation. Um, so the academic one should come from um, a professor, an academic mentor or advisor, um, a residential college dean, um, someone who can obviously speak to how you've done um, as a student at that particular institution. Uh, and the professional one should come from a manager, supervisor, um, somebody that oversaw your work, for example, at a summer internship. So um, anyone who served in a supervisory capacity um, in, in the professional realm. And uh, the last thing I wanted to say was that um, we have nine joint degree programs with other uh, uh, professional schools and graduate programs here at Yale University. Uh, Silva scholars are absolutely welcome to apply to, uh, to any of them. Uh, and indeed, every year we have several uh, Silva scholars pursuing a joint degree program. So, uh, that's kind of all I wanted to say. Uh, I will now turn to the students and um, I'll ask each one of you to introduce yourself. If you can uh, just maybe give us your name, your year in the Silva Scholars Program, um, undergraduate major in institution, um, and speak a little bit about your decision to apply to the Silva Scholars Program as a college senior, why you decided to pursue an MBA immediately after college. Um, that'd be great. Starting from here? Sure. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Lucas. Um, I did my, I'm in my first year here in the Silver Scholar Program. Um, I did my undergrad in economics, politics, and philosophy at the University of Oregon, UK, but then also did a master's in behavioral science with a focus on behavioral economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I think that actually ties into what the reasons why I applied for the Silver Scholar Program. It has an academic component where I started from a very theoretical space of the mathematical philosophy of economics, then the behavioral component in my master's. Uh, but then I realized I don't want to pursue a PhD. I actually want to apply those things in an actual organization. I want to form um, things with this knowledge. And I think an MBA prepares you for exactly taking that step of translating theory into actual organizations. Um, and then the second perspective of why, why I wanted to uh, pursue MBA, and especially that early on, is that I'm particularly interested in um, social impact businesses, so the, the overlap of a social impact aim and a for-profit structure. And I think it, especially in that space, it is um, a big advantage to be able to show you MBA early on, to, to show you that I'm, I'm a pragmatist in that field, right? I actually want to um, create something. I know the business side of, of, of um, such organizations, so that's a great signal early on. Um, so those were my two main reasons why I wanted to pursue the Silver Scholar program. Yeah. Hey everyone, so my name is <clears throat> Hannah Webb, and I am actually in the gap period. I'm in my third year um, of the gap period, somewhat unexpectedly. So for undergrad, I was at the University of Georgia, and I was actually a business major, so I majored in uh, finance and international business, so fairly traditional. Um, but in looking at what I wanted to do after I graduated, I found that a lot of the options post-graduation were very standard. So you would go in, do your analyst program, maybe get promoted in two or three years. Um, and frankly, I wanted the opportunity to get some credentials where if my ability allowed me to go farther faster, that I would actually be able to do that. And to me, getting an MBA from a school like Yale and getting it very early was going to empower me to do that. So a lot of it 
um, from my perspective, was actually a career booster. So I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do in my career, um, but I've definitely found that, you know, coming here and even with only one year of experience from Yale, it was an enormous career booster, and I've gotten promotions at two companies already in my gap period that technically I shouldn't have been able to get, but I was able to get them because of Yale. So it's been, you know, absolutely confirmed everything that I was hoping when I applied to the program. So it's, uh, it's been great. Hi everyone, my name is Helen. Uh, I actually joined the program in 2017, took one gap year, so I'm currently a returning Silver Scholar. Um, I, I was an economics major at Wellesley College, um, and I decided to join the Silver Scholar program fresh out of college because before graduating, I actually didn't have a clear career interest, to be honest, and I figured, you know, this, uh, this program gives me that opportunity to kind of build my professional network, get, in, get me introduced to different disciplines uh, in the business world, and also um, give, kind of buy me some time to make a more informed decision of my per, uh, career pursuit. So, you know, it has worked out pretty well for me. So I'm, like Hannah, I'm pretty happy about where I am right now. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Liam. Um, I am in my first year of the gap year, and um, as an undergrad, I was a math and fine arts double major at Wheaton College and studied in an engineering dual degree program at Dartmouth College. I think the SOM curriculum really appealed to me because it was so interdisciplinary, which is obviously something that was important to me. And um, yeah, I, I started to have kind of a feeling as an engineering undergrad that um, engineering was only going to solve technical problems, and most of the world's most pressing challenges aren't technical at this point. And the things that were keeping me up at night weren't how to make this um, you know, algorithm 1% more efficient, but how do we think about the implications for real people, um, who it's for, who are making it, and those kinds of things. So SOM feels like exactly the place where I could engage that, and Silver Scholars was the place that I could engage it most immediately. So I applied. And I'll echo so far, I've really enjoyed it. Um, one other quirk about my participation is that I actually deferred for a year before starting at SOM because I won something called a Watson Fellowship. And uh, for me, the flexibility that Maria mentioned has been really um, an important factor in my um, getting the most out of this program. So if there are any questions about that, I'm happy to follow up more later. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I am the second Hannah. Um, so Hannah Webb and I actually started in the same year in 2016. Um, and I have since taken two years off and I'm now a returning Silver Scholar. Um, I did my undergrad at Bates College, uh, where I actually studied, designed my own major in international development and paired that with a double major with French. Um, most of my experiences pre-SOM were in international development at the intersection of economic development and environmental sustainability. Um, I mostly was working for NGOs and quasi-governmental organizations, um, which I really enjoyed the mission of, but was interested in figuring out how to apply that in a um, market context, um, working for a for-profit company where I thought that there might be faster uh, routes to change. So similar to Lucas, interested in the social entrepreneurship and kind of for-profit business models being used for uh, impact. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, since then, I've loved the Silver Scholar program. Um, and similar to Hannah, I think I've seen it as a booster for my career um, and has allowed me to really pursue uh, my interest in what I identified as impact investing. Um, and that's really what got me to come to SOM to learn those business skills and that business acumen in order to pursue that. Great, thank you. So my next uh, question was about um, sort of on-campus involvement. Um, and I know, Lucas, you're brand new. I don't know if you've had a chance to get involved in any clubs, organizations. Um, can you speak a little bit about, um, about that and maybe a little bit about SOM culture and how that played into your decision to apply um, into the Silver Skulls program? Um, sure. Um, I mean, absolutely right. I'm, I'm brand new, uh, but even just having the first few weeks, um, so you're, you're just bombarded with, with different uh, clubs and information opportunities. Um, uh, so maybe let me talk about the SOM culture 
first, um, because that was actually for me a long, lot, for a long time, I was thinking about whether I should, would want to do an MBA or would rather do an MPA, um, so more on the public sector focus. And one of the reasons was that, um, for example, during my, my, my master's, I experienced a lot of very cutthroat um, MBA courses at other schools. Um, and arriving here, I had um, and immediately the, the the feeling of a very collaborative environment, um, and everyone would be um, very welcoming, would be very supportive, um, and uh, it was an environment where it was very it was very fine to, for example, express those are the areas that are my weaknesses, and then that's what I want to develop. Um, and I didn't expect it to be. Um, that open and collaborative, which is absolutely great. I, I love that. Um, and uh, well, in student clubs, similar to my to my interests, I'm uh, very involved with the, with the Startup Entrepreneurship Club. Um, and there are um, a whole a whole array of social impact uh, clubs. Um, so I'm still sort of discovering those those bits and pieces. Um, but um, it's it's a very diverse. Place. I thought, for example, that I'm going to be sort of in a, in a niche with my interest. And then I think the second event I went to, Hannah was sitting on a panel saying, oh, I'm a silver scholar and I'm doing social impact business. And I, oh, and I just thought, OK, I'm at the right place. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so really great so far. Yeah, so uh, definitely the culture of SOM has been really good. And it was a big part of why um, I ended up accepting my offer um, as well. I will say that, so I'm actually, I'm not in social impact, so I don't do, <laughs> sorry guys, <laughs> um, but so I'm, you know, not looking to work at a nonprofit, but I am looking, you know, I sort of take the view of, I'd like to feel good about my work. I'd also like to make money while doing it, and a lot, to be honest. Um, but one of the things I really enjoyed about SOM is it is a very collaborative environment, and you don't feel like, um, you know, you can only go up by someone else going down. Um, at the same time, uh, people here are very, very driven. Um, they are going to succeed, and it's not a question of if, it's just how they're going to do it. Um, so you definitely have some very ambitious people. You have people who you just, you know, you can tell they're going to have, you know, three houses and a boat in a couple of decades. <laughs> um, but they're not going to do it in a way that, you know, they wake up in 20 years and feel really bad. So I found that balance to be um, very nice, and I think that's also important at a school to that actually encourages you to pursue what you enjoy doing, what you feel good about doing, because I have found that SOM is far more diverse than any of the other business schools I looked at, because the attitude here is, if you want to do something, then just go do it. You know, if you're not doing it, that's because you're not pursuing it hard enough. Um, I actually knew one person who wanted to work at with a particular political person, and they said, oh, well, we don't do internships, and she said, that's okay, and she literally drove down there one weekend and got an internship, like, they made an internship for her. So she was like, I'm going to pursue this because this is what I want to do. And so I think that culture of a lot of ambition, but also the attitude of I will make it work for me. And that creativity is great at SOM. Um, and as far as, you know, student clubs, I was actually a member of several because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was part of the consulting club, women in finance, um, investment banking for a short time, investment management. So you really can pursue a lot of things, even if you're not going to necessarily pursue it as a professional career. If you're just interested, you know, you're welcome to go to their events. And I found that really, really enjoyable. Okay, so SOM culture for me. Um, I actually visited a bunch of um, different schools before I, before I applied. And, you know, when I got to Yale, it just, I feel like the school has a such different character compared to others. Um, I guess it's kind of hard to really verbalize what it is to me, but I think it kind of gives me a really good balance of, you know, the ambitious self in a business sense, you know, as a businesswoman, uh, businessman, but also the more collaborative, socially responsible self um, for me as a human being. So I think that balance is what as, uh, makes as, as SOM really stood out to me. Uh, and in terms of student clubs, yeah, I was also involved in a whole bunch. I think my favorite one as of now is actually Food and Wine Society. <laughs> 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 we invited actually our wine professor. It's really, really cool. Um, he is the sole distributor of Shadow Shoes in the U.S. And, you know, shares. he's so willing to share everything that he knows about wine and food. And, you know, in, in this club society and this class in particular people just sit together talk about you know their lives while enjoying the wine it doesn't 
it, it not only fostered a really close community, but also helped me professionally as well as, as I talked to my colleagues, my client, my boss about, you know, wines and food. You know, it's, it's a great exposure. And I would say uh, student clubs here are very, very diverse, and you can certainly find a place um, that you like. Yeah, that's all of that is definitely true. Um, I would also add that um, while you can find everything that you want at SOM, uh, SOM is also much more integrated with EL than I understand most other business schools to be. So like, it was really fun for me that for the past, and um, this is my second year now, helping to run the EL School of Architecture student publication. And um, like, that's something that I don't hear my friends who are at other business schools having the kind of opportunity to do. Like, um, not to call out names, but like you don't go to University of Pennsylvania, you like go to Wharton if you're in the business school there. And I think it's cool that this is like much more um, integrated. That wasn't a Lucas reference. Just, <laughs> um, just like uh, about the, the other business schools that we see. So um, in addition to like, all of the ways that SOM fosters a really supportive and collaborative and kind community with people of all different kinds of interests. Um, it is also more connected than most to like a broader community where you can find even more. I think it's cool. Yeah, I, you guys all said it. I, I, think it's, I, would, I would echo everything you said. Um, I think the reason that I, I was actually similar to Lucas, I was still trying to decide I knew that I wanted to do something uh, to further my education in uh, economic development, in international development, looking at impact investing. Um, but I thought that that could be, you know, an MBA or a different degree. And kind of as I was looking at different programs, I was really drawn to SOM um, for the culture, um, for both the knowledge of business acumen, but also for this kind of collaborative culture where I arrived here. And even just on, um, I think it was welcome weekend, I got here and within the first like 10 minutes, I had uh, five other emails of like students that people had said like, oh, you're interested in impact investing, you need to connect with this person, you need to connect with that person, you need to connect with like this other person. Um, so I think just people here are so willing to share their knowledge, to share their contacts, to collaborate with you on projects you're interested in doing. Um, so I think that was really a, a big factor for me. Um, I would also say in terms of student clubs, uh, I was involved in uh, responsible investing clubs, student government, hockey club, which was super fun. Um, I think there is really like pretty much anything you can find, uh, anything you want, you can find. And if you don't find what you're looking for, I also started, uh, I'm now like teaching meditation and yoga. And so like, if you want to do something, like you can also bring what you're interested in to the community, so. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, so my next question was about your professional goals. Um, have they changed since you applied to the Sea West Coast program? And, um, for those of you who have completed this, uh, an extended internship or are currently completing it, can you speak a little bit more about that, your role and what that looks like? Um, yeah, I'll keep that brief because I have less to say about that. <laughs> um, but I think what I can say about, oh, you heard what I'm, what I'm interested in. I think the key thing that changed for me is that actually, despite an overwhelming first few weeks, it was actually quite a confidence boost. Um, so if you're, for example, in your learning teams, which are like, small groups in which you do group assignments, etc., cetera, um, and you work along, you know, the, um, McKinsey, a guy with, with three years of experience, BCG, some investment bankers, um, and uh, you learn a lot from them at the same time, you know, they have questions, sometimes you can answer them um, and you actually realize, you know, you, you can, even, even with someone who have, has that many years of experience, you can um, interact with them, you can work together with them um, and, and you can pick up on, on little language things that, you know, especially industries like to have as barriers to entry. Um, you pick up on that and you, you just feel a bit more confident in acting in, in such environments. Um, and I think that that helped me to say, okay, no, I, I can actually go forward with what, what, I, what I want to do. Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, I'm actually in the third year of my gap year. I extended it again, um, actually because of the career I ended up having. So when I first came in to Yale, I actually already had an offer from Deloitte Consulting and I had worked with them 
So I actually worked with him for a year and actually ended up deciding that consulting was not for me, um, which was okay. You know, I, I had a great time there, but I realized, you know, this isn't what I want to pursue long term. And what I actually ended up doing was I was debating about, you know, whether to come back to school or not. Um, and I had actually set myself a four-week deadline that if I could find something really interesting in a four-week period that I would delay my school by one more year. I thought that I could, you know, grow a little more and, and be a better person when I came back. And I actually ended up um, having Citibank reach out to me. So I currently work for Citibank. I was originally um, supposed to work for them for one year. That was the plan. Um, and I actually did believe that was going to happen. Um, but what ended up actually happening was pretty surprising. They offered me a position as a vice president and a product manager there. Um, so that's the role that I currently have with them. Um, it's an incredible role. I'm in their digital division. I help to get two new products to market. I manage those products, everything from um, you know design to development to launch to maintenance to bug fi fixing and you know meeting financial targets and everything involved in that. And what's really cool about the role, other than that I actually really, really enjoy it, um, it's something I wasn't expecting to do, but now I can see myself doing this longer term, um, is that this role is actually a, a post-MBA role, um, and it's supposed to be a two-year rotational program out of MBA, and then you can have this role. Um, but I had, during the time period that I was a, you know, working as a, as a contractor, they said, you know, we're really impressed and we think you can handle this role. So I would say that that's a really big um, testimony to how Yale really helps you, because I'll be perfectly honest, I'm pretty sure they gave me the interview because Yale was on my resume, <laughs> if I had to guess, um, which is, you know, it's okay. Um, okay, I did other stuff. Um, but <laughs> basically, you know, they'll, they'll at least talk to you for roles that they may not otherwise have wanted to talk to you before. Um, and that, give, you know, that opens the door and allows you the opportunity to prove yourself. And I am now in a role that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I really enjoy my job every day. And it's, you know, very challenging, very dynamic. Um, but I also have to remember that, you know, it was thanks to Yale that I got this several years earlier um, than I otherwise would have had the opportunity even to um, apply. So I think in terms of my career, it goes back to what I was saying of wanting to boost it. That was definitely accomplished. And it's also introduced me to a relatively new um, role of a product manager, um, which is a great role to be in right now at any company. Um, so it's completely changed the direction of my career um, and definitely for the better and, you know, introduced me to a company that honestly I'd never thought about working for uh, in the past. So it's made an enormous difference. It was somewhat unexpected um, and I actually ended up extending to work for City longer. But, you know, I can definitely thank Yale for a really exciting career right now. Yeah, I will certainly echo Hannah in saying that. You know, Yale has such a strong brand equity, <laughs> as we all say in the <laughs> business world, uh, that uh, it will open up a lot of door for you. Uh, so in my gap year, uh, I took one gap year and did two internships. So the first one I was uh, working at KKR in Beijing, and the second one was uh, doing investment banking at Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong. Uh, and pretty much I pursue the more traditional finance route, aka less exciting um, <laughs> but more structured um, and um, I don't think my decisions have changed that much but I think Yale has gave, given me a different reason why I made those choices I think having taken all those classes in entrepreneurship and all other disciplines uh, I know that in the long in a very long term, <laughs> I wanted to start my own venture, perhaps start my own fund, and you know, it it without this education at Yale, I probably wouldn't even think about that because I was just not having enough exposure to um, those areas. So, um, have I? How have my professional aspirations changed? I think it gives me a longer term career vision uh, and purpose of what I'm doing right now. Uh, and I do believe those bad seeds will eventually sprout last. Um, I mean, we're also like writing these, this story, so I don't really know um, how to talk about it yet, but I, I definitely have continually changed my career aspirations in light of new information. So. Um, before I mentioned briefly my Watson Fellowship in which I really thought that I wanted to do public interest technology work. Um, realized on that year that uh, 
that wasn't uh, changing the world in exactly the way I thought it would. Um, surprise, you can't change the world in a year. Um, <laughs> so yeah, came here and was able to reflect a little bit more and uh, have since done much more kind of systemic work um, digitizing government services for the International Trade Administration or um, this past summer I was working in the Boston Mayor's Office uh, of, it's called Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. It's like their R&D and innovation team. I was writing their future of work brief, which found, felt kind of meaningful. Um, and since doing that work, uh, like found a lot of it really delightful and impactful, um, but wanted to see like a broader range of projects and people and um, I guess just develop more on the kind of good learning that I was, I was doing here at SOM. So I've since gone back to consulting to the social sector at a little firm called Wellspring. And um, it very much feels like finishing school for an MBA in some ways. Like I make, uh, it's, yeah, I feel like every day is, a, a, is an SOM raw case. Um, and I don't really know where it's going to land yet, but at this point I'm having like a lot of fun. I feel like I'm learning every day and doing important work, um, trying to solve strategy problems for nonprofits. So we'll see. I, all I can say is that it definitely changes as you learn a lot. And so far that has been really fun for me. Yeah, I would maybe, again, draw on all of these themes of, like, check to Hannah's, like, this being a career booster, check to Helen's, like, this making me plan for my career more long term, and then also check to Liam's, like, this being something that within my classes, within the career network that I've built here, like, I'm constantly getting new information, and that's constantly forcing me to reassess and realign my priorities in terms of my career. Um, so I think getting here, uh, I came to SOM because I wanted to go into impact investing. Um, I did end up getting an internship in impact investing, so working for a private equity firm in New York, um, was working on their financial inclusion team, uh, basically uh, providing capital for financial inclusion products in India and South Africa. Um, and that was exactly what I wanted to do, so I was really excited about that. And I would not have been able to get that job um, straight out of undergrad. I didn't have background in investment. Um, I really just had kind of the passion for social impact and some background in uh, having worked in India before and uh, looking at economic development. So I think definitely like a career booster for sure. And then I think in terms of planning more long term. Um, so after having or during that internship, during that extended internship, I ended up actually leaving to start a uh, company with my brother, which is financing solar for low income communities in the US. Uh, so using blended capital, both equity and grants in order to finance solar so that we can then actually send a portion of the profits back into the community for education funding on environmental literacy as well as green jobs training. Um, so that's been a wild ride and I think something that I would not have pursued if I didn't have my first year of business school, the amount of times I've referred back to my notes from core <laughs> classes that literally like as I'm taking them, I was like, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, you know, pursue a job in marketing um, that I've now per like looked back on and actually used these concepts and theories uh, in in this year and in this uh, startup environment. Um, so that's been really exciting and something I don't think I would have ever pursued uh, without this program. And now looking forward, I'm going to continue working on that company um, while also potentially uh, interning and working with an impact investing venture capital firm. Um, trying to stay kind of close to that social innovation nexus between startups and funding for startups. Um, and I think that that's largely based on classes that I've been taking, you know, this year and, and professors that I've been meeting with. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at the questions that are being submitted. And um, we have one uh, about the Career Development Office. Um, how do you find the internship and what resources does SOM provide to help? So I was wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, the Career Development Office, the re resources it provides um, to the Silver Scholars, which ones have you used, which ones have you found most helpful? Um, 
I can. And sorry, and if you have any experience with the alumni network, if you can touch on that as well. Uh, I can again start with the sort of early phase of, um, <laughs> of that process. Uh, what I really liked is if you uh, come here straight in, in the beginning, uh, the CDO, so the Creative Development Office, has a lot of programming um, just about experiencing different career paths. Um, so for example, there are panels with um, people from different industries, all, really all kinds of industries. Um, and um, it's even if it's, if it's without uh, nameplates, so you can basically you're free to ask whatever questions, um, and you're just giving that uh, you're given that opportunity to just really ask the questions you always want to ask and just sort of discover different um, different industries, which is incredibly helpful even if you think you know what you want to do just by seeing other areas and thinking, okay, yeah, I really don't want to do that. Um, that's great. Um, so just by having a lot of exposure to different um, career paths that CDO provides as information, um, that was already really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar experience. So I had actually thought that I wanted to get more exposure into the sort of the finance field. Um, actually, specifically, I was looking at um, investment management, ended up not pursuing it. But, you know, the CDO was incredibly helpful. I was looking into a field where I really didn't have much of a background. I just had an academic knowledge, but they were very helpful and I ended up talking to a lot of companies and really understanding that field better and a lot of that was through the CDO and, and getting those contacts. Um, and I can even say there was a member of the CDO who actually no longer works for Yale, but we're still in contact because I thought she was so helpful and I made such a connection with her over time that, you know, we still like will grab coffee every once in a while. So they definitely, they really want to help you and you can make really good connections with them as people and also keep in mind I found that the people who work for the CDO they used to work in industry they know a lot of people they know what they're talking about and you know the things they say are very very helpful I have found yeah I can speak for more of the traditional finance side uh, I think one of the challenges for silver scholars is actually because our program is structured so differently sometimes it's harder to talk to you know recruiters from the company exactly when you're going to graduate like this like small details like that they might have an impact on whether or not they you can pass the first round screening process and CDO is actually very very helpful and proactive in reaching out to me offering to help you know issue some you know letters from school to help me then explain to the companies uh, what the structure is like um, you know the flexibility of this program so I think that um, that aspect is really, really helpful uh, if, if you guys are thinking about more of the traditional finance um, uh, career path. Um, for me, um, in terms of navigating the professional network, uh, I think I, I benefited the most actually from also court classes. Uh, you know, starting from my first internship in, and um, at KKR, I wanted to, you know, explore more options. And I actually, you know, also look back at my nose thinking about, you know, all those active listening, you know, show vulnerabilities, how do you talk to your boss, leverage different stakeholders, all those kind of stuff that we talk about in class to uh, strengthen your network and engage more people to help you with your career aspirations. Um, and then, so when I was, you know, thinking about my second internship, I actually got so many people around me help me with the process. And uh, it, as a lot, and it's largely a result of, you know, me, uh, knowing those networking skills that I've learned here at, SL at, at SOM. Yeah, I th there are a few things that I found super helpful about um, how SOM approaches Silver Scholar internships. The first thing was um, when I first got here, I was like really worried that I wasn't uh, like going to get a job because my experience was really untraditional. Um, and I like didn't know all the words that everybody around me was using. Um, and yeah, it was just really intimidating. Like I was competing for jobs with people who had years and years of work experience. Why did I think that um, anybody should hire me over them? But um, yeah, I feel like it, I think Lucas, you were talking about it as like in uh, I don't remember what phrase you used, but it was kind of like an ego boost, not just to work in classes with people, but also to have um, 
the like I remember Stephanie in the CDO was like, "Don't ever say that you're not qualified for this." She's like, "You got this," um, and I like never said that I wasn't confident about my ability to do a job after that. And um, yeah, I ended up getting like an MBA level role. So uh, and so far, I feel like I've been killing it. So like the kind of um, yeah, like it can be really intimidating. I think to be in the in the like job market at SOM and it, it shouldn't be, it doesn't have to be. And the CDO is really good at reminding us of that, making sure that we have the tools so that um, we are capable of doing that work. The other thing I would say is I did have some doubts about what I wanted to do. And uh, it was really helpful to have like a really uh, diverse set of people that I could just ask what is your job like? Like, what does that actually look like? And people from across the Yale Alumni Network were really willing to just like sit down and do informational interviews with me, which was awesome. Um, and really contributed to me figuring out what I wanted to do and uh, like where I wanted to do it and to me getting the position that I'm in now. So those two things were really helpful. Yeah. Um Again, <laughs> when I call you all. Next time um, I'll start with you, Hannah, okay? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would say that it, it kind of depends on what it is you're looking to recruit for. I think that if you're looking for a more traditional career path, um, like investment banking or consulting or working at kind of a larger company, then there's a lot of recruiting on campus. Um, and in that case, like the CDO is enormously helpful in having one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, being able to prep for your interviews, being able to prep on your story, being able to provide you with contacts for informational like coffee chats, things like that. Um, and I think that that process is very well laid out and really, really well supported. And then I would say if you're looking for something maybe less traditional, like, for example, I think uh, just smaller firms um, that don't have huge HR teams, don't have very structured recruiting processes, um, then I think the CDO is also really helpful in terms of connecting you with alumni who either work in firms like that or who can refer you to other firms like that or who can leverage their networks to help you find what you're looking for. Um, I would also say clubs are an enormous resource in this process. Um, so like for investment banking, the finance club, you'll get literally paired with a second year buddy that you'll meet with once a week and you can go over uh, like, here's my interview process, here's how it's going, um, let's do a mock interview, like here's some feedback. Uh, so I think second years are also a really great resource uh, I found in my first year. Um, and so, yeah, and then I would say also just the alumni network, not just in recruiting, but also when I was starting my company, I literally would just cold call people and be like, hi, can you talk to me like about solar? You're vaguely in the industry. Can you just talk to me about like this idea and what you think? And I was honestly surprised at how willing people were to spend their time, uh, you know, giving their time to me and giving me advice and helping me along that process. Um, so I would say the network is really helpful, CDO is really helpful, and also just your network of students around you are also all really helpful. Thank you. Um, so we received a few questions that are more related to admissions, so I'll try to address them very quickly. Um, one is about eligibility. Can students in a master's program apply to the Silver Scholars um, program? And uh, yes, <laughs> Lucas is the living example of that. <laughs> um, I just There is only one stipulation, actually. As long as you have not taken time between your bachelor's and your master's degree to work full time, then yes, you're absolutely eligible to apply to the Silver Scholars program. Um, can civil scholars receive a scholarship? Uh, yes, we make the process actually very, very easy. Uh, there is no box to check, there's no essay to write. The moment you submit your application, you're automatically considered for all the scholarship money that we have available. Um, there's a question about testing, GMAT or GRE, and is a higher score needed for the Silver Scholars program? Um, so first of all, we accept both the GMAT and the GRE. Um, we don't have a preference for one over the other. It's completely up to you which one you want to take and submit to us. Uh, and we really, truly have no preference uh, in large part. It's also because of the um, number of joint degree students. Every other graduate program at Yale University requires the GRE. So uh, if you have your heart set on the GRE, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you can submit that score to us. Um, is a higher score needed? So um, 
Because Silva scholars uh, come into the program without full-time work experience, um, we can't really compare their resumes to those of candidates who have worked for five and six years. Uh, which means that we do place a stronger emphasis on academics. Um, now, academics really means uh, the standardized test score, GMAT or GRE, uh, your academic record, so uh, your transcripts, uh, and the academic letter of recommendation. All of those things fall under the umbrella of academics, and we do put a lot of stock into that because, um, again, as I said, uh, uh, we cannot uh, compare your um, your resume to those of people that are significantly significantly more experienced uh, professionally. Um, there's a question about the best round to apply in. Uh, we always say the earlier the better, but obviously whenever you're ready. Um, we just um, uh, finished round one. Uh, the, the application deadline was uh, on September 10th. So we have two more rounds coming up. For the Silver Scholar specifically, we received the bulk of the applications in round two and three. Uh, and um, it doesn't really matter so much statistically uh, because the Silver Scholars program itself is not capped. Uh, although the, the total uh, MBA class is capped, um, but um, you know we, we, we always advise you to submit an application earlier uh, because if you submit in January, you get a decision by the end of March, uh, and it's really better for you because uh, from then on you can just plan your life better in terms of what you want to do, uh, you know, around graduation, over the summer, and and so on. Um, so. I think there's a question here around um, most uh, MBA programs that allow college seniors uh, to apply um, allow for uh, a deferment of two to five years, really. Um, and the question is, why does SOM prefer uh, direct matriculation? Um, and the reason is obviously we want you to get that first year of the MBA program under your belt to start immediately applying that job into your, um, into your internship. So um, the students have completed an internship or are completing an internship. Can you maybe speak a little bit to that about some of the lessons drawn from the core curriculum, from your first year of the MBA experience, how that has been helpful on the job? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so kind of as I said, I was interested in impact investing, had a background in kind of economic research and maybe market research, but much, much less so in terms of analyzing a company and uh, doing diligence on a company in order to make an investment. That process was very new to me, um, but it's actually something that we learned about, you know, through accounting, through sourcing and managing funds, through our investor class. Um, these were all core classes that uh, provided me with a lot of information that I otherwise would not have known or didn't really have exposure to, uh, and that I used pretty much daily on my job um, my first summer. And then also moving into working on a startup, uh, I constantly am referring back to notes on, um, you know, accounting, for example, <laughs> like for my financial modeling skills, like all of that was started and built here. And I'm now using that literally every single day. So. Yeah, I, I frankly don't totally understand the deferred admission thing. Like if you're going to defer admission and then start two years later, why not just wait and apply then? I don't like I didn't have my life that figured out to know what I would want to do in two years. Um, but I didn't know that I wanted to get the MBA core. And uh, I don't feel like my not having work experience made it harder for me to do the core, but I would not have gotten the job that I got if I hadn't already done the core, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, there's no way I would have gotten an MBA level role if I hadn't already done the core. Um, so in that way, it's totally a career accelerator in the way that the program advertises. And I'm sure Hannah can uh, support that even more. Um, so yeah, I think the model makes total sense. And I want more people to do it so that uh, people understand it better and it becomes a norm. I think it makes sense. Yeah, I, I would also echo that. I think the 
to, to me, it's less about the, the hard skills that I'm concerned with, more of the soft skills. So in talking to firms, like a lot of the questions that I got asked when recruiting was that, why should we offer you an associate role, right? Um, because you kind of, you know, as you're no longer an analyst, you're an associate, then you're expected to lead an independent work stream, manage a team of, you know, you know two to three, three to four people then it's really the soft skills that makes the difference and less so about, you know, do I really, really know the exact details of a model? Um, I personally benefit a lot from uh, learning more, you know, the interpersonal dynamics aspect. And I think that makes me stand out compared to other applicants maybe looking for a more junior position, I think. Yeah, so like I said, I'm I'm about 90% sure I have my job right now because I already had Yale on my <laughs> resume. So I think the big difference between having something deferred and getting that first year, yes, you learn a huge number of skills. You know, while you're there, you learn the soft skills, which I definitely think are more important. I know I matured as a person during that first year enormously. Um, but what it also does from a very practical point of view is it puts a very big name on your resume. Um, not that I didn't love my undergrad school, um, but it was a state school, and you know I now have Yale on the resume that is recognized globally, um, and that that is nice. I mean, people will reply to your Yale.edu email in a way that they just won't. And a perfect example, I'd actually applied um, to an internship for one big consulting company, and as undergrad, and actually they wouldn't even give me an interview. Three weeks after I started at Yale, they invited me for an interview. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, and it was, I guess I was in their system as Yale.edu now. I didn't end up going. But, like, um, it does make a difference um, in terms of just, for me, it, you know, once you're in the job, it makes an enormous difference. But it also makes a huge difference in just opening the door and starting that conversation in a way that um, I was really impressed at how much of a difference it really did make. And so I think having that advantage is huge. I would also point out that for me, at least, because I did completely change my career track during that my gap period, I think it also gives you a level of flexibility and comfort with flexibility that I don't think you get from um, more traditional routes. So, for example, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do a very unusual program is because it basically forced you to be different. Um, and I was personally worried that I was basically going to get, I was in the consulting field at the time, into consulting, you know, two to three years promotion, two to three years promotion, two to three years promotion. You know, was, I mean, you know the next 10 years of your life, and that's really boring and very scary. <laughs> um, and it's very traditional. You don't stand out. Um, so by forcing you into an unusual, unusual situation, you almost can't go back to that traditional path, which can be very scary, but at the same time makes you more flexible. And a really good example is when I first started working at Citibank, they actually told me, they said, we can only employ you for one year. Now that turned out to not be true, <laughs> but they actually said, at the end of this year, are you okay not having a job and having absolutely no promise from us that you will have a job? And I knew that I could go back to school. So that was okay. Like, it didn't matter. I had sort of a golden parachute of saying, yeah, I mean, I can do just one year, and it turned out to be the entrance into an amazing career, um, but you have this opportunity to take, you know, maybe only a six-month internship, or um, I had a really good friend who actually took a summer internship with no, no path to a full-time offer after that. Now, it turned out she ended up getting a, a really amazing offer at another firm, and she continued along the path of what she wanted to do, but she had no guarantee after about 10 weeks over the summer, but having Yale to fall back on, you can be much more flexible and the risk is much lower. I mean, the worst case scenario is you go back to Yale. Oh my God, <laughs> that's horrible, you know? Um, and actually, I'll give a really good example of that. This was actually an interview with Bill Gates. People say, oh, he dropped out of you know, Harvard, he took such a risk. And his comment was, no, the worst case scenario for me was to go back to an amazing school. And that's kind of the situation you put yourself in. The absolute worst case scenario is a scenario that most people would really, really like. So, you know, embrace that flexibility. You get a lot out of it. I got a lot more out of it than I thought I was going to. Oh, fantastic. So we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask each one of you to give a quick word of advice to everyone that's working on their application right now. As I mentioned, we have two more application rounds for the 2019-2020 cycle. 
Um, so just very quickly, what, what would you advise them? Could be anything either related to their goals or the application process, anything that helped you looking back kind of at your journey as a candidate. And we'll start with Hannah again. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, so I guess I, I would say, um, one, congratulations on already being here. Watching this means that you have some idea of what you want. Um, and I think that that's a huge part of being a college senior and trying to figure out what that next step is. Um, I guess my piece of advice would be, uh, being here already, like, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't stress too much. I know senior year in college <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly, um, can be a wildly stressful time. Um, and I would say try to use this application process as a time that will uh, actually benefit you. Use it as a time to, like, while you're writing your essay, while you're thinking about, you know, how you want to speak to admissions, how you want to speak to people that you meet at these schools. Use this as a time to reflect on what it is that you want, what it is uh, you're valuing, what you're prioritizing, how you imagine, um, you know, the next couple years of your life and what you want to get out of that. Uh, then, you know, at the end of this journey of admissions, of application, no matter what happens, that was something that was valuable to you and that you can use moving forward no matter where you go. Yeah, I think that's really right. Um, I Kind of what I was going to say, too, but um, <laughs> I'll put a twist on it. Um, one of our professors here said at one point um, that you're not trying to get an offer, you're trying to get, like, a match. Um, he was talking about, like, in your employment search, but I think it's true more broadly. Like, we can get really caught up in like, oh, am I going to get into this place? How many grad, which grad programs am I going to get into? Which jobs am I going to get? And none of that matters. Like the thing that matters is that you find yourself in the place that is really right for you. And so um, through this process of applying to like a million jobs last year, um, I realized that like it's really important to be yourself in the process and to be genuine about what you want to do, um, and like that match will happen if you just do that. So that's my recommendation. Okay, not too much to add, <laughs> so I'll keep mine really short. Um, I think I would advise all of you guys to really be prepared for some challenges, because there will be, um, but also be really, really excited for a lot of opportunities. I think. You know, Silver Scholars Program empowers me to do things that I didn't know that I could do. Um, so I would really encourage you guys to, you know, you know, think about that and be excited for um, what this program can bring to you. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is to be honest um, when you're applying. You know, be yourself and figure out what you want to do and be honest in that essay because I totally agree it does need to be the right match. Um, when I actually got, it, you know, accepted... I actually went to the school and came here before I accepted because I wanted to make sure it was the right cultural fit for me. And I think even if you go to a great school, if it's not the right fit for what you want to do and your personality, it's still going to be the wrong decision. Um, so when you're writing your essays and when you're applying and when you're interviewing, um, just really figure out who you are and who you want to be. Reflect that in everything that you're presenting to the school and they are going to know if it's the right fit. And, you know, also figure out, um, you know, how this is going to help you become the person you hope to be in, you know, five or ten years. Well, now I'm in Hannah's role. And, <laughs> <laughs> what should you have? Um, but, but drawing on those points, maybe, what does it mean pragmatically? And I think that the, I was in a similar situation where you, you, know, so you try to force this essay to, you have this idea of what criteria are they looking for, and you try to fit it into those criteria. Um, but I think what those comments mean in the end, give yourself the freedom to actually ignore that for a second, just write what you actually think, because we, we do that actually quite rarely. And then you might be surprised by how well you can work with what you've written there. Um, and that makes the process so much easier than, than trying to write it while having all those constraints and components in, um, in, your, in your mind of how you want to write it. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm sorry that we, we didn't get to all the questions. Uh, but you will receive a communication with the recording of the webinar. You'll get our names and email addresses. So feel free to follow up and ask us some more questions. Thank you.